Welcome back to the Mega Theorem Club podcast, guys. As always, my name is Sean, and I'm here with Spencer today. How you been, man? You know, not too bad, not too bad. I, uh, I've i had a busy summer, which is why you've probably seen a little bit of a hiatus from us this summer. <laughs> I don't know, it's our busy season. Yeah. Um, but I've also gone through some life changes. I taught again up at the Wilderness Field Station up in the Boundary Waters of northern minnesota and that was awesome teaching the next class of students all about insects was it just about insects or yeah it was uh the the class is called insects of the north woods intro to entomology basically or something like that so so what's up there other than mosquitoes oh my god everything so many great things which one of them i'm not I'm going to be kind of talking about a little bit today, but there are a lot of mosquitoes. This year was particularly bad. There was a lot of water and a lot of rain early in the season, mm. and which more water means more mosquitoes. <laughs> so it was bad. I mean, I there was at one point I was on a portage and I was counting how many mosquitoes were on the Duluth pack of the person in front of me <laughs> just because, you, you know, you're carrying a canoe and it's like, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 pounds and you're just trying to to think of anything but the mosquitoes Mm -hmm. and how heavy the canoe is. So you automatically just start counting the mosquitoes. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And I, you know, I was trying to like, you know, try to get a rough estimate based on like the size of this little square I was counting. And it was like, there was like over 2000 mosquitoes on this backpack alone. Yeah, it was crazy. And so you can imagine that's one person's like backpack. How many are flying around their head? How many are underneath the canoe? Uh, How many are on every single person behind you? And you're like, yeah, this, it made for some troubling times, but you know, you get through it and the mosquitoes are bad, but they're not as like, they're not so bad that they can destroy your trip. If you know what you're doing, bring, bring some bug spray. Deet's the only thing that will actually work. Sorry, but <laughs> if it doesn't have DEET, it will not work against Minnesotan mosquitoes. Do you so, think they'll build resistance to that eventually? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, well, no, I don't no. think so. <laughs> yeah. I, I said yes, but the more I think about it, I think there's enough of them that still get to other animals that don't have DEET or mm. people that don't use DEET or just you when you're not using DEET. That it's not like a germ that mm. is living within a culture that you've put this germicide on. And it's like, now I'm going to be the one to survive. It's like, well, it still has all this other options it can use. I don't think there's enough selective pressures for, for it. Gotcha. But, but I mean, if everybody was always wearing DEET and you sprayed everywhere with DEET, then yes. <laughs> but I don't think that's happening. So. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. And then I started a new job. I quit my job at the college. Lots of reasons for that, but none that are against the people that I worked with. The love, if you're listening, I love all of you guys. I miss you. <laughs> uh, but it was time for a change, and I needed some lab experience, so now I'm working in genetics and enjoying that nice Um, so that's going well yeah it's going as well as it can be so nice yeah yeah well and uh yeah what what about you sean (laughs) before you got too far off the boundary waters topic i wanted to say that i was finally able to check out the boundary waters in northern minnesota myself this summer even though it was without you two guys and i had heard so much about it from you guys so uh, I had the opportunity and I went and it, it was amazing. You're right. I do love it up there. There's beautiful forest and lakes, not a lot of people, which is also great. I stayed in a remote cabin that was only accessible by boat or watercraft. Well, I guess you could swim, but that might take a little <laughs> while to, to get there. It was right next to the Boundary Waters. It was a lake maybe you know 10 minutes away or something. You could get to the Boundary Waters via watercraft we camped we kayaked we listened to the loons and the wolves which was pretty intense at times uh we slept out in hammocks at you know a couple campsites and there were wolves Mm. around us for sure and zach zach even asked me if he if i thought it was a coyote or a wolf and nope (laughs) it's a wolf (laughs) (laughs) we don't have wolves in indiana but we have coyotes so i'm very familiar with coyotes these things did not sound like those unless they have like a different 
accent up there or something. No, you know, like, they're, they're they're wolves. You you'll find coyotes, but they're going to be almost concentrated around the urban centers mm. like Ely, Minnesota, and some of the other towns. When you get out and about, you you have wolves. Like that's okay. That's what well, they is. guy that I stayed with there. It's like their family's cabin, and mm-hmm. it's been in their family a few generations now. But they have trail cams up, and they do catch a wolf every now and then coming like right next to their cabin. So yeah, definitely, definitely wolves there. He said he's never seen them. He's never seen bears while he's up there, which I guess I kind of find that harder to believe, but. Did see bald eagles. We did see loons. We had a lot to drink. Uh, It was a good time. But, oh, one crazy thing. I watched a bald eagle hunting a loon. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. I, you know, we we got used to hearing loons. And then all of a sudden, I I thought I heard an elk because this loon was freaking out. It was like a distress call that I hadn't heard yet. And next thing I knew, there was like a, there was a bald eagle dive bombing it and the loon would go underwater and come back up and it was just freaking out and it was all alone you know you normally see them in pairs and the bald eagle would circle back take another dive and then it would just sit in a tree next to it just staring this loon down while it was like freaking out it was it was like something straight out of nat geo pretty wild oh that's cool i i saw my first wolf this summer so i know for a fact that they're up there nice i mean we are field stations got them on camera and some other you know people have seen them but i saw my first one it was actually on my drive up i was well about 15 miles south of ely minnesota okay were you on the scenic route i was yeah i guess you could call it the scenic route i mean it's all scenic (laughs) (laughs) and anyway so 15 miles south and i look over in the side of the road and i see this big moose just chilling which is crazy to see one so far south. I'm, you know, you you you'd expect them. I mean, they're they're pushing more northward because it's just too hot for them. So it was crazy mm. to see one so far south. I mean, it was early June, basically the end of May. So mm-hmm. you know, it was still a little bit cool. But then I get on the north side of Ely, right off the cutoff to the dirt road that leads you to the station. And that's where I saw my moose. And I was like, this was the perfect drive up here. It was, it was amazing. So, so so that dirt road is there right at that cutoff. Is there a bar named Sam's? Yes. What? Dude, that's the road that our cabins off of. Are you serious? Wow. The cloquet line? Yeah. Huh? The cloquet line? Cloquet line? Yeah. That's what it's called. The road? I. Yeah, the road. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know the road's name. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. But the, there's yeah. across the lake from us. Uh, there is he. He would say there's some sort of research station there. That's it. That's the field station. Oh my god, you what? were at the field station. That's I, crazy. I thought you guys like paddled somewhere to get to. No, it, it makes sense as to why you have to because if you're on the other side of the lake. You don't have road access to that side of the lake. No. Um, yeah. So you have to get into the boat launch and then boat over to there. Let me think. We're There's only directly a across, of... <laughs> like almost directly. If... I know exactly the property. That's crazy. Yeah, that's a small world, dude. I thought you like, I thought to get to your field station, you had to go through water or something. No, no, you can drive to it. Uh, it's on a dirt road that you saw. Um, so low lake. No, no, no. Low lake. Yeah, it's on low lake. <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. that's crazy. Also, what? like it's been like two weeks, and I haven't talked to you about this. So this is yeah, yeah. I've huh. spent so many, so many things on low, or so many summers on low lake. Okay, so you know, let's see. Uh, there is. I mean, you you would have been there after students were there, so uh, you wouldn't have actually seen the students there. Um, we went over there like, and like, we're, we're scrambling around on your guys's like property. Yeah. That that's where I teach. That's crazy. Oh my, I wanted to yeah. walk up to the cabin, but I, I didn't, the, I wasn't sure where the trail went. It looked like mm. it was like a, you, I don't know. Do you guys have a trail that goes down to like a rock, a big rock that yeah. juts out into the water? Yeah. That that's called swim rock. So, that's, swim where, rock. that's where gotcha. I was. So, you know, that yeah. campsite straight across that's yes. That, yeah. That's where we swam. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, uh, then around the corner, maybe half a mile down Low Lake, closer to Bass Lake, is where we camped. Yep. 
Yeah. Ba- oh, wait. Did you camp on the 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 campsite that has like the big kind of rock that juts out into the lake on bass? No, no, no. We camped on low. Uh, oh, you camped on low. Yeah, okay. just like around the corner from that swimming oh, like, hole campsite. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh! That's How a, crazy that's is small world, that? Dude. That huh. is so small. There are ten thousand lakes. And <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> you happen to be on the one that I am the most familiar with. <laughs> well, I might have um, left a poop over there for you if you you know that's fight it next perfect. year. You know what would have been crazy if I if I would have could have made it work with you and i would have been like driving up there and been like okay what lake are we on oh my god i'm going back (laughs) oh yeah going right to the same exact spot i was just here uh so i'm gonna have to tell the director that's hilarious did you did you guys ever go in and drink at sam's or is everybody too young so the students are too young generally there Mm. are a few seniors that are old enough i've never had a drink at sam's even when i was like program assistant like the old director was like adamant that no alcohol i mean there's no alcohol on the campus like on the research Uh, station none whatsoever gotcha um do people bring it of course they do (laughs) (laughs) of course they do (laughs) but i did go to a few bars in town a few times but i never went to sam's i don't think oh go there i've never had cheaper drinks yeah i believe that it's so nice yep yep dang okay well now we now we have to go back um yeah and i'm sure i'll get invited up if i'm not teaching up there next next summer i'm sure i'll get invited back up for a guest lecture or something and oh I'll... nice so my my friend goes his name's charlie he he listens to this sometimes what's up charlie he uh he it's a tradition now we he he goes every year it's his family's he goes yeah, once nice. twice at least a year and so yeah. i'm going I'm, i want to go more regularly with him so yeah i'm sure certainly. i'll be back yeah Wow. And you went after all the mosquitoes and black flies were gone so oh i went like during the... i like it was the best it was, it was like yeah oh, i've been it, i've been in in late well i guess you would have been in early september yeah. i've been in late august and it was i mean you cannot sleep in a hammock earlier on in the summer unless if oh, you yeah. have like a zip net one. Oh yeah, yeah um i i i didn't have a net and i didn't get bit. okay yeah that's nice and it was like fall was just beginning to touch the leaves like the week i was there the yeah. leaves are changing and I, i'm sure now it's like amazing Oh, perfect job there. It's just, yeah. Um, I really want to go in fall because the weather is great. Obviously, the views are great. The sad part of it is, is like the reason I like going early on in the summer is like that's when the most, ev- that's when everything's active, right? Oh, everything's yeah, yeah. just flown back up if they're your bird or a few insects. And so everything's like a buzz. Mm-hmm. All the birds are singing, the loons are calling, the wolves are like, hey, we just had pups. Like, we're ready <laughs> to go. And it's, kind of cool to see it come alive but like you do have to suffer through the bugs like the oh, mosquitoes yeah. and black flies are horrendous at that time oh um, that reminds me one bug thing every flower i saw i would stop because i love my pollinators i have never <laughs> seen so many surfed flies oh yeah uh-huh there, i had, think i we... saw one bumblebee the whole trip surfed mm-hmm. flies have got to be like the number one pollinator up there I'm sure they are. I mean, I mean, there are a ton of butterflies oh, and there yeah, are a ton yeah. of native bees. Like, I don't know at what point their population starts to go back down in the late summer. But I mean, it's crazy. Like, you can just take a bug net and just sweep it across and you'll get everything. We found lots of bumblebees. Um, oh, yeah. It was, maybe I'm just too late. Yeah, it might be a little late. But every year I think I catch a rusty patch. Really? And then, but no, it's it's the orange belted bumblebee, and I'm like oh, the brown belted. Uh, Is it Bombus grisiocolis or grisicolis oh God, or something gonna, like that? Yeah. I don't. Um, I, I think I think you mean brown belted because they do they do look all very similar. But I know what you're talking about. Or is it or or is there a one called orange belted? Orange belted bumblebee, Bombus ternarius. Ooh, oh, oh, I, I was not. See, I don't know my northern ones. I guess. Yeah. Nice. That's cool. But so it was never rusty patch. It was. It's never been a rusty patch. I don't think they get that far north. <laughs> but I'm always like, maybe. 
maybe. Well, um, here here's a great pivot for us. What yeah. does a rusty bumblebee have in common with what we're talking about today, Spencer? Well, it's an endangered species. Uh, and Sean, what is an endangered species? <laughs> well, an endangered species, according to the interwebs, is a species that is very likely to become extinct in the near future either worldwide or in a particular political jurisdiction. Let's just paraphrase the Wikipedia and it could, by <laughs> saying that it could be due to a number of factors such as habitat loss, poaching, invasive species, climate change. But the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, has a red list and they are the, you know, the global conservation status holders of all these species. And other agencies will assess species within an area and many nations will have laws that try to help protect them but it's the iucn that like will list them as endangered or not and i know we've discussed this before but i always forget so i thought it'd be a good reminder that in the iucn list goes in order of not evaluated ne data deficient dd and then Low, lower risk, near threatened, and this is you know increasingly threatened. We're going up the scale. Uh, after yeah. near threatened is vulnerable, then it's endangered, then it's critically endangered, then it's extinct in the wild, and then it's extinct. And so endangered, everybody thinks that's kind of like the end, but there's actually a few levels past that. But today we are talking about endangered species yeah it's definitely one that can get a little tough <laughs> to talk about yeah a little depressing a little depressing yeah it's oh i thought of a future episode while doing this one it was we should do episodes on our f- quote unquote favorite mass extinction <laughs> um <laughs> okay yeah. and then i was like oh man it'd be great to talk about the, the sixth current one great mass extinction. <laughs> yeah i was like oh how can that be your favorite when it's happening right <laughs> now <laughs> you can literally see it yeah <laughs> occurring around you <laughs> but anyway but we should do that and maybe yeah maybe we can talk about ones that have happened in the past and then touch on the, the, the current, current one, one. <laughs> yeah. uh, as like a hey by the way <laughs> so okay well, if you don't mind, I guess do you want do you want to start off? Do you want me to start? Off? I'll, I'll, I'll happily start. Uh, I don't know okay. what yours is yet, so we'll just leave the surprise for the end. Yeah, honestly, I can't remember yours. So oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I chose an endangered species that I have personally seen in the wild. I'm not sure if it is the only one, but it is definitely the first one that comes to my mind. I wait, saw- wait, wait. Let me let me guess. Ivory billed woodpecker. Oh, uh, I wish. Is that even <laughs> you? Huh? <laughs> you and every other bird around here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every time I see a woodpecker, I'm like, is it? Nope. Is it? Is it? <laughs> is it pileated, right? Is, no. oh, 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 is it ivory, Bill? <laughs> oh, and it never is. Never. Never is. <laughs> and it never will be. <laughs> Unless if you believe in the conspiracy theories. I don't know the conspiracy theories. That That's... they're actually still around, but the government is hiding them, so people don't go after, <laughs> like looking for them and disturb ah, them. Yes, that's <laughs> so... <laughs> that's what the but government anyway. cares about. <laughs> what it, what is actually but, yours? Yeah, so I I saw this species on my study abroad in New Zealand, and as part of my program, we had an excursion to the north shore of the southern island where we stayed in Picton. We were able to kayak, and then we had this dolphin whale watching by boat into Queen Charlotte Sound, also known as Totoranui, and that is Maori if you weren't familiar. And the idea was if we came across dolphins, we could swim with them, and everyone was excited. Turns out the only species of cetacean that we would see that day were Hector's dolphins, and these were so endangered that we were not allowed to swim with them. (laughs) <laughs> so i don't remember watching them for long maybe 10 15 minutes but most people were upset we weren't going to be swimming with dolphins that day because that was what everyone was talking about at the time i don't think i realized the importance of what i was seeing but looking back now i, I am pretty appreciative of it and i hope everybody else you know 
grew to love that experience instead of being upset that they weren't swimming with wild dolphins that day. But what is a Hector's dolphin? Cephalorhynchus hectori is the only cetacean endemic to New Zealand. For those not sure what that means, endemic means restricted to an area. So it is the only whale slash dolphin slash porpoise that can be found in New Zealand. Well, waters around New Zealand. It actually... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. So if they're the only dolphins that are around, then how did you even have the chance to swim with dolphins? No, it's the only one that can only be found. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So the only one that's endemic. Sense. So other, other whales and dolphins can come there, but they also go other places. Right, right, right. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't want to leave New Zealand, so I get it. You, yeah, it's a horrible place. It's just definitely not... <laughs> beautiful at all it's actually one of my favorite places i've ever been and would love to take my wife back and me and you and spencer and my wife <laughs> don't, we're going don't, back yep, yep. <laughs> so this species actually consists of two subspecies c hectori hectori and c hectori maori the first is often referred to as the south island hector's dolphin which is what i would have seen and the other is known as the maui dolphin the Maui dolphin is actually listed as critically endangered. Actually, I might be talking about both an endangered and a critically endangered, but I couldn't talk about the one without the other. So we'll get to that later. And you're probably wondering how they're different. Bear with me for a bit. First, we'll talk about the Hector's dolphin, the southern island one that most of the information that I found can be applied to both anyways. Hector's dolphin is the smallest dolphin species with adults measuring between what I read, uh, 3 foot 11 inches and 5 foot 3 inches, but some places just say 4 feet, and they weigh between 88 and 132 pounds. That is really small. If we compare that to a bottlenose dolphin that everyone has some image of in their head, bottlenoses can reach 13 feet and weigh between 330 and 1430 pounds, with an average (laughs) size more like 600 660 and so that is a fifth or less of a size of a bottlenose dolphin on the internet there's a lot of size comparison images of a hector's dolphin next to a diver and it's it's adorable you just think the diver has like a little stuffed animal and when i (laughs) the more i read about these guys i'm like yeah like these are the size of that large stuffed dolphin prize you win at a carny but it's filled with bones, muscle, and organs rather than fluff. So, you know, take something that size and put weight on it. And that that's a Hector's dolphin. They look too cute to be real, like aquatic little pandas. And actually, yeah, they, they are shades of black and white. I guess you could say 50 shades of gray, but uh, I'll skip that. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but really, they have black markings around their face and fins and their fluke or tail fin with a gray top side body and a wider underbelly. The black markings around the face are described like a mask, so the panda comparison is not entirely wrong. Obviously, they live in the ocean, but like all marine animals, they have a preference in their aquatic environments. These little cuties appear to prefer murky water near the coast, usually seen in water less than 160 feet deep, but have been seen in water up to 330. They tend to move from shallower to deeper water as the seasons change, from summer to winter, and come back in the spring. It's also said that they are generalist feeders, mostly concerned about the size of their prey, with a preference under 10 centimeters, which is about 4 inches or smaller. There have been larger prey found, but they prefer the smaller ones since they are so small. They will eat fish that school at the surface, fish in the middle section of the water, and a variety of benthic or bottom dwellers. Some prey examples include red cod, squid, and juvenile stargazers, which, if you don't know, these are those really goofy-looking fish that live on the bottom with eyes on top of their head, and they're always just looking up as if they're stargazing. As far as predators go, they're eaten by a variety of sharks, including great whites, blues, makos, and killer whales are a a supposed predator, but there hasn't been much confirmation as if as whether or not they actually do but i can imagine a killer whale's not going to pass that up as long as it's the right what am i trying to say not species but pod you know yeah. different pods of killer whales sense. eat different things i'm yeah. sure if they if the right pod comes by they're not going to pass on these little bite-sized morsels <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, <laughs> it would be very sad. Maybe they'll maybe they'll like mistake them for like little baby killer whales since they're mm, the same yeah. color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> One can live in that bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Hector's dolphins form social groups that are often small, usually five or less, and they are separated by sex and age. There is some sexual dimorphism between females and males, with the females being longer. These small groups only mix when it comes to mating. And fun fact, the males of the Hector dolphins have relatively large testes in proportion to their body size, with them weighing up to 2.9% of their body weight. Oh my gosh! So if we, so if we put that in perspective, if let's say I weigh 170, <laughs> that would mean if I had testes the same relative size as these dolphins, they would weigh almost five pounds. Oh, <laughs> can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. Talk about oh. some big nuts! Like I <laughs> could not like, keep pants on. The, the, <laughs> But the, the large size of these nuts would suggest these dolphins are trying to mate with as many females as possible, and monogamy is not in their vocabulary. Like other dolphins, they do use echolocation, but their clicks are described as lower source level due to living probably in a coastal area, so you know their clicks aren't going out as far because there's, they're in a smaller environment. And so they cannot actually see prey as far as other species of similar size, but it's because they live in a much different environment. You know, back to this two subspecies thing, and then I'll get to why they're endangered. But you may, you know, have some guesses as to why that is already. The, the southern Hector's dolphin is only found around the southern island of New Zealand, and, and it's found almost all the way around the coast except for a small southwest section, and I'm not sure why. The Maui dolphin seems to be exclusively found on the western coast of the North Island, and not even all of it, just like a section of the North Island, and that's the only place you can find these dolphins. While there could exist between 7,000 to 10,000 of the, of the southern subspecies, depending on you know what your source is, the northern one is estimated to have around 100 or less than 60, depending on what your source is, left of these individuals. Genetic and skeletal differences are why they're classified as separate subspecies, but I couldn't find why. What what the skeletal differences are. They look the same. They're described as the same, so I, I'm not sure what the skeletal differences are. And these significant differences are unique because they're not usually seen in marine mammals that are so geographically close. So they're only separated by the Cook Strait, which is you know, a body of water that separates the North and South Island. It's not terribly far, but it's supposed to have separated them about fifteen to 16,000 years ago due to its deep waters. Since they prefer the shallow, it's kind of like a fence, even though they can just swim right over it. They prefer not to. Well, the Kraken might reach up and grab them. That might be it. That the, you know, they might have some deal with the Kraken of like, hey, I'll stay down <laughs> here. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> they'll stay up there. We'll we'll all be good. Yep. But recently, in the you know, in the last few years, surveys are conducted uh, on the Maui dolphins, and they'll collect DNA from live and dead specimens. And Hector's dolphins, the southern species, like will pop up with you know with the southern subspecies. While there's no proof that they're actually like interbreeding or mingling, they likely could due to their genetic composition. And it's not like a huge area that they're in. So it's like hard for me to imagine that they're not mingling, intermingling. And here's where I say, of course, they're probably breeding. We, we've seen far more different species breed and successfully procreate than these two closely su- closely related subspecies i mean we were talking about blue whales and what was it was it fin whales i think that was yeah you know we we've talked about like species different species being able to breed and these are classified as subspecies and they're breeding or like or like there's no evidence of it but like of course they probably could like you know we're, we're humans we like to put things in boxes mother nature doesn't like boxes no, she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and you know this. This may be. This may seem like a good way to successfully increase the northern subspecies population. Let, let some southerners mingle, breed with them. But 
Others also disagree on this, and they say if you introduce southern hectares and allow them to breed with the northern Mauis, this would increase the numbers, but the hybridization would recombine them as one species, effectively eliminating the Maui subspecies and technically causing them to go extinct. So it's almost like speeding it up. And this is actually happening with a few other birds around New Zealand. And I thought that was really interesting. That was like a new concept for me. Like hybridization eliminates species. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But it's uh, it's I'm, like in the human's eyes, right? Like, right, right. You know, what, it, there's still going to be these stuffed animal sized dolphins right. swimming in this water that are black and white and have the exact same behavior. Right. But we're... But I call them different. Mother Nature is changing the boxes, and we're just grumpy about yeah, it. Yeah, we're like, we want this oh. box, and <laughs> not that box. We've, we've already put a label on it. I don't want to have to relabel this. <laughs> I don't want to get rid of that box. That's my favorite box. Why are they endangered? Shocking. It is because of humans. Oh, and what? <laughs> no way. Uh, <laughs> The Hector's dolphin deaths are a direct result of commercial and recreational fishing using gill nets, also known as trawls, where they just, you know, they just drag nets and catch whatever they catch. I'm sure there's more to it than that, but there's also, it's also not, it's also not more than that. And... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's pretty simplistic. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> it, like, you're not down there, you're like selectively, no, oh, I want that fish or that fish. It's like, no, this is, this is where we fish. This is where we trawl uh-huh. our nets. And uh-huh. the, the dolphins are actually attracted to these nets, probably because there's tons of fish in them. And Yeah, it <laughs> would be too, yeah. And, and they end up as bycatch and they get caught in these nets and suffocate to death. Sad. And at one point, death by fishing nets were thought to account for 95% of human caused deaths. Other threats include tourism, disease, and marine mining, and that population size uh, of the Hector's dolphin is now only like 30% of what it was in the 1970s. Some estimates suggest uh, 19 to 93 of the southern dolphins are killed annually by the nets, while I've also seen numbers up to 150. Because the northern ones are so few, there's less than one of them killed a year by the nets, but that just means like every other year there's like one. Right. It, it is thought that while this seems a lot of these, there's not a lot of these animals left. Some studies suggest that the fishing industry alone is not great enough, not a great enough threat to prevent them from making a recovery to at least 80% of historic population. So this is good news. There, there's hope that control it a bit. They could make a, a, a bounce back. If they're not too genetically bottlenecked at this point. Efforts to save them include marine protected areas that are all over New Zealand now where gill netting is prohibited. And it started off being like two miles from shore. Then it's four nautical miles from shore. Now it's up to seven nautical miles from shore. You just can't use these nets. And it just keeps increasing, which is awesome. Other marine mammal sanctuaries were set up to manage non-fishing related threats such as, you know, restricting mining and seismic acoustic surveys. And the IUCN, you know, we talked about those earlier, actually suggests that we should be protecting these dolphins all the way out from shoreline to 100 meter depth. So we just find wherever that 100 meter depth mark is and just follow that contour line and that should be where we set those gill net limits but don't know if we'll ever hit that you know these fisheries they're pushing back they're saying it's not all their fault where the statistics would say yeah it's probably a big part of your fault Um, probably (laughs) the you know there's people that are blaming domestic cats which for just saying that sentence you're like what the like that's crazy domestic cats are not killing the dolphins but cats are known to carry toxoplasmosis which is a parasite and it's said to be released into fresh water that that gets carried into the ocean it's picked up by the food chain and then eventually makes its way into cetaceans and an estimated three dolphins three dolphins a year die from this compared to the 150 from being bycatch yeah no i think it's the gill nets that's probably hurting them and i'm glad that there's some protection on that the toxoplasmosis is a little 
scary. Rarely affects a lot of cetaceans, and them being so close to shore is, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's a chance. Three a year is not a large number, but when you're working with a population that's under 60, that's probably a little scary. Yeah, I, yeah, oof, oh. yeah. That's the southern Hector's dolphin in the Maui dolphin as little bonus subspecies. Nice. So some hope. Some hope. Yep. If, yep. Let's just. Th- there are success let's just stories. Get out there and do some some pirate. <laughs> let's become pirates and stop all these boats. Yeah. What's what's the law on that? I'm sure if they're, you know, only we, seven miles from shore, Sean, are you in international we live waters outside yet? the law. We are pirates. That's the oh, there's idea, the, yeah. you know? we I, we're outlaws. I would love to be on those anti whaling boats that like oh, fight the Japanese. So fun. Oh my god. Yeah, I definitely I'd do that. Yeah, I'd do that with <laughs> Let's do that while we go to New Zealand. Yes. And we'll just That's how we fight get anything along the way. Yeah. Perfect. It's a plan. Your wife is gonna be so excited. <laughs> she loves the water. <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> well cool well uh, i'm gonna transition it away from the water Ooh. to land okay and i'm gonna talk about i've already said it i said it very briefly when we were chit-chatting before the episode um, but i'll be talking about a critically endangered species oh this is the most north american species you can get it's called the american burying beetle Ooh. So it's a beetle, falls under the order Coleoptera, but falls under the family Sylphidae, which is all the carrion feeders or the carrion beetles. Some are called bearing beetles, some are just called carrion beetles, yada, yada. I mean, those, those are really the only two <laughs> names. But uh, carrion, for those of you who don't know, is just like already dead meat or rotting meat. A vulture is a carrion bird, so it's... You know, they're going to be the ones that are finding the, the rotting roadkill on the side of the road or, and whatnot. But these beetles, the American bearing beetle, are carrion beaters, uh, beetles. So, little about, well, I guess, yeah, they're endemic to North America. Specifically, kind of, if you take, they're technically in like two Canadian provinces or historically have been in two Canadian provinces. But you just take the eastern half of the United States and that's them historically wow (laughs) so yeah nice big range for a beetle you pretty much will find them south of the boreal forest once you hit that kind of northern boreal forest so you won't find them up in the boundary water you will find other species of bearing beetle which i'll talk about maybe just for fun a little bit later but anyway back to the american bearing beetle which is nicrophorus americanus is the genus and species name for all of you uh, nerds out there. So like I said, they're carrying, def- they're carrying feeders. So they, they're acting as nature's custodians. And when an animal dies, a small animal, rodent, small snake, small bird, yada, yada. Well, if it's not immediately picked up by some larger scavenger, or if it wasn't killed and eaten right away, then it's just going to sit on the ground. And the bacteria within the gut biome of that animal they're going to start digesting that dead animal. And when they do, they release chemicals out into the air. And male bearing beetles have really kind of what we call almost plumose-like antennae, like big feathery-like antennae. And to increase the surface area so they can pick up on this even the smallest trail of particles for a dead carcass. So once they smell something, they're going to fly in. They can smell something up to a mile away, which is crazy. Um, They'll fly in, they'll land, and then they'll start releasing their own pheromones to hopefully incentivize a female to come. And depending on the size of the carcass, you might have, if you have like a really small mouse, you might just have one mating pair take over that carcass. But if it's large enough, you might have two or three pairs depending on the size. But usually the largest beetles get the carcass because they'll kind of fight each other for it. So once a mating pair has like established that, hey, you and I are going to mate, we won this carcass, well, they're going to do something different than a lot of other carrion beetles. So there's just like the carrion beetle, which it'll just fly into the carcass and it's just going to start eating 
laying eggs, ma- you know, mating, laying eggs, and just doing what they're doing. The burying beetle gets its name from the fact that, yes, they do, in fact, bury things into the ground. And it's kind of crazy about how they do this, because if you can imagine, so these beetles, they're about an inch long. They're black and orange kind of spot. They're black with like orange spots, kind of bright orange spots in a way. They're all obviously a lot bigger than like a ladybug, but they're also like the reverse of a ladybug. And they're a little bit longer, more like a ground beetle. Once they established, yes, this is ours. Well, they have to move it to an area where they can actually dig down into the ground. And you'd think, okay, maybe they grab it with their mandibles and they drag it. Yeah, they might do that for a little bit. But if they really have to move it, (laughs) they lie on their back and they like use their legs to like scooch it across their body. And then the male and the female like switch places. So as soon as like it gets over the female's body, the male's already behind ready and picking up the the trail right and then she'll run around she'll do that and they'll just kind of keep doing that and that's how they do that and then they'll find like a softer area underneath the leaf litter or some pretty loose soil and they'll dig down so their front legs are fossorial meaning that they're meant and adapted for digging they're not as uh, as adapted as like a like a mole cricket would be where basically it's like oh my god those are shovels on the front of their legs Eh, they're they're a little bit flattened. So they'll dig down and they'll bring down the carcass down into the ground. Now, the advantages to this is essentially just outcompete other things that want to eat that thing. Uh, now, if a fox comes and digs it up, there, there's nothing they can do about that. But what they're really trying to avoid are flies because flies are also really fast at finding dead carcasses and flies can reproduce faster than they can. So if you have a bunch of flies laying maggot, you know, eggs and hatching into maggots, they're going to eat everything before the beetles can do what they need to do. So they've just said, you know what, we're just going to take what we have and we're just going to lay them uh, or, you know, we're just going to lay our eggs on this thing underneath the ground so that we can eliminate uh, the competition from flies. There's another little cool caveat here. Another mutualistic relationship, Sean. We don't want those. So if. (laughs) <laughs> yes, if you find a burying beetle, really any type of burying beetle, it doesn't have to be the American one, and you grab it, you'll probably notice that there are a lot of mites running around on the beetle. And you might think, "Ooh, it's infested. Ooh, it's going to die." No, the beetle's like, "I don't I don't I don't care. It's like <laughs> whatever. These things can be on me." And that, because the mites, there are certain mites that uh, you know, that go for plant matter, and that's a lot of the mites that you might be used to, like the little red ones and stuff. But other mites, they go after insect eggs. So they hitch a ride on the back of their bearing beetle, and they're going to not attack the bearing beetle's eggs, but they're going to attack the fly eggs. And so if it happens that a fly did lay some eggs on there, well, if you're carrying around some mites that are going to go eat them, well, then you're solid. Like you've got a cleanup crew to eliminate the competition, which is a really cool mutualistic relationship. The mites get moved around for food, and the beetles get a cleanup crew. So there you go. Once they have it underground, they'll mate and then they'll lay eggs. A few days after that, the eggs will hatch. And then these beetles will do what many other beetles don't do. And that's parental care. They will actually tend uh, and feed the larva as they're growing up, as they're approaching this pupil stage. And some of the things that they do for this is they'll like actually eat some of the carcass and regurgitate some of that like pre-digested kind of stuff into you know into the larval mouths essentially if it's a mouse they might shave the hair of the mouse to expose the gooeyness underneath (laughs) and yeah they're just watching out over them and male the males and the females both do this which is crazy that even just one of the sexes does it and the fact that both of them do it is even crueler i don't know they're an insect i mean you really only find that in like the true mutualistic insects like bees and ants and stuff. Even then the males aren't doing shit. That's true too. Yeah. They can't even feed themselves. (laughs) No, they can. They're just like flying pockets of sperm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. (laughs) Crazy. Um, Crazy. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And so anyway, that's what these beetles do once, you know, after like uh, some time to get to the pupil stage, 
the the larvae will crawl down into the soil they'll pupate and within a few months they're they've emerged as adults ready to repeat the cycle and that's that's them in a nutshell they're amazing so when i take students out and we want to catch not the american bearing beetle but just bearing beetles we will actually use dead animals maybe roadkill that we find or mice that are you know snap trapped in the kitchen or something like that or we'll tie one of the legs of the mouse with a little piece of fishing string or just a little piece of string and we'll just put it on a rock or a little you know pile of leaves we'll tie that to a log and then we'll just walk away we'll come back a few hours later and then you can just follow the string down into the ground unbury it and then there are two berry beetles they're like what the heck is going on <laughs> it's a trap uh, it's a trap. And then you can literally just repeat that over and over again until <laughs> until you're like, eh, we've got enough. Let's let this couple do their thing or or whatever. So, yeah, pretty cool. All right. Let's talk about why the Mer- the American bearing beetle is endangered. Sean, can you take a guess? <laughs> uh, aliens. Aliens. <laughs> kind of. Fre- yeah. Freaking yeah, aliens. Us. <laughs> <laughs> us oh, <laughs> like yeah. white people white europeans uh, <laughs> aliens from another continent some invasive species an invasive <laughs> yeah pretty much so like a lot of animals they're in, they're heavily impacted by habitat loss so we've taken a lot of that land and we've turned it into parking lots in cities and even in our suburbs like just grass like they can't dig down into that they're not specialized for that the the kentucky bluegrass that makes up your yard is terrible for all insect life a lot of everything (laughs) a lot it's it's good for nothing it's literally get rid of your grass people (laughs) please oh my gosh uh i hope my brother-in-law is listening i know you work hard on your lawn and I, he, well, actually, I have to give them credit. They planted a native prairie, oh. a little section in their backyard. Nice. And they're really working hard on it. And it's looking good. But it's one of those things where you have to trust the process. It takes multiple years to establish. Proud of you. Now just do your whole yard. <laughs> <laughs> the habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Well, also they're insects. So widespread use of pesticides are going to affect them. It was pointed out. And I didn't know that I didn't know this before, but their populations or at least documentation of their populations crashing happened before the widespread use of the most infamous pesticide of all time, DDT, which is kind of crazy that it's like, yeah, this is probably not likely due to DDT. It was probably accelerated by it like Hmm. everything was. But in case you aren't aware, DDT is a pesticide that was Famous for essentially overuse in like American agriculture and all that excess would run off into the rivers and then run off into the oceans and get inside the fishes. And then the eagles would eat the fish and then the eagles had this DDT inside them and their eggshells then were like super thin. So whenever an eagle sat to incubate their eggs, they would literally just crush the eggs because the eggshells were too thin. I actually read a, an article and I really want to talk about this specifically as an episode sometime. The caveats of not using DDT, like a human a humanistic standpoint and specifically thinking about malaria. But anyway, uh, back to American bearing beetles. So they were put onto the endangered species list in 1989, which is pretty early on in the endangered species list, especially for an insect. Yeah, wow. Like a lot of butterflies were kind of added on the first year in like the 70s or whatever because everybody likes butterflies and, you know, they get all the publicity. <laughs> but this lowly like, you know, carcass eating beetle, the fact that people were like, hey, we're not seeing these anymore. They used to range everywhere and by 1989 they were only found in rhode island huh that's it that was the only place you could find them why rhode island oh that i don't know that that didn't say i didn't i didn't read that i didn't find anything about that i just i mean i just read that today and i was like what the hell because because a lot of the efforts and i'll get into this a little bit more uh for their conservation are actually in the lower midwest Mm. so which is kind of cool but anyway so yeah they were basically gone and i have to talk about and i've talked about this with my class one of the 
most interesting potential domino effects in like North America, in like our our history, is that there used to be a bird called the passenger pigeon. Are you are you familiar with it? No, I think I heard about it. It's an, an extinct species of bird. Very pretty, right? Looks a lot. It, well, it looks a lot like a morning dove, mm-hmm. like just a general like pigeon. <laughs> and at one at like one time, their population was predicted to be like three billion. This was a bird that dominated the landscape of North America pre the arrival of the Europeans, but even up until like the mid 1800s when their populations really started to crash because white people just started (laughs) hunting them to extinction. And of course, habitat fragmentation and loss. But really, like people just were shooting them out of the sky. They would have contests to see who could kill the most passenger pigeons because they thought at that time there was no possible way they could ever make an impact on the numbers <laughs> of these birds. Billions. That's, and that's like, yeah, I get it. You know, you shoot a gun and you kill 15 of them in one blast and you're like, Oh, that's out of 3 billion. Yeah. And there's like this kind of story about the last one in the wild was shot by this like kid. He was like an 11 year old kid and he shot the last one out of the sky marked as like an occasion, but the last passenger pigeon in general died at the Cincinnati zoo in 1914. It's still on display there. They taxidermy that they have like a little shrine dedicated to her, but she was the last of, of her species, the last of what once reigned in the billions. Huh? Well, what happens when you take something that was in the, in the billions and you just eliminate that from the landscape? Something else is going to change. Yeah, that's going to have a cascading effect, a domino effect down different tropic levels, specifically one tropic level in this case, because that was a direct food source. Those were the perfect size carcasses for the American bearing beetle to do their thing. Maybe even two or three pairs could utilize one bird. Huh. Well, now it was gone. And... People started noticing that the the decline of the American bearing beetle well before it was even placed on the uh, endangered species list. Because by the time it was put onto the endangered species list, it was basically extinct. There was a handful of them known in Rhode Island. And so it, this took decades. And people are like, this is probably a direct result of taking out one bird species. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, let's talk a little bit about their conservation now. What the heck are some people doing? The Center for the American Bearing Beetle Conservation, which is out of the St. Louis Zoo. Shout out to the St. Louis Zoo being one of the coolest zoos and the fact that it's 100% free. Wow. 10 out of 10 recommend. It's an amazing zoo. It's free. It's right next to the Art Museum, which is also free. St. Louis, you're doing good things. I know a lot of people kind of diss on St. Louis, but at least they have a free zoo and art museum and like – they have a really cool garden. I like St. Louis. <laughs> That's just me. So, but I don't have to live there. So, but anyway, but the St. Louis Zoo, they have been for like 15 ish years, been trying to save these bearing beetles. So they go out throughout the kind of like Missouri, Oklahoma area, and they've been doing releases of them. So they have a, a breeding program at the zoo, which is super successful because it can be really hard to actually breed a lot of things in captivity. But they, uh, and I was reading their impact report from 2024, and they're like, as of, you know, as of this year, we've bred like 14,000 beetles, <laughs> which is a lot. It's not enough, obviously, mm. uh, but it's a lot. Like, that's amazing. That's cool work. And they will go out to different sites around, specifically prairie sites, and they will release anywhere from like 150 to 300 beetles at a time, marked individuals, I might add. So they will glue a little thing to their uh, elytra or their, to their hardened wings or, or may I don't, I guess I don't really know what they glue to. So they'll glue something to it, a marked individual. And then every year they'll go out and they'll count how many bearing beetles that they can find marked or unmarked individuals. And every year that they've done it up until they said in their little impact report until 2018, uh, they had seen an increase in population. And they have been finding, even since 2018, every year they find unmarked individuals, meaning that there's enough carrion out there, enough carcasses out there that they can actually find them, mate, and have a successful generation to, again, raise up more. Now, 
they've been struggling in the last few years to get to the level that they were at in 2018, but they've been slowly making a comeback. They didn't do any releasing releasings during the year, first year of COVID because no one did anything during the first year of COVID. Uh, but they were able to come back the second year, do some really good work and do some some really good large scale releasings the year after that. And they're kind of back at the level. So they think they're continuing to move forward. And now this is all to say, like, this is a lot of work. They have to have like a team of people raising these in captivity. They have to have a team of people to release them. They have to have a team of people to go out and survey for them. This is a lot of time, money, and effort that goes into this for this one species of critically endangered beetle. And it's working, but it's it's not like they can just do it and let it go. This is like something that we're going to have to keep doing probably forever because we can never get back the passenger pigeon. And we're also losing a lot of other species that are the perfect size for them anyway. So I, yes, by all means, keep doing what you're doing. It is not in vain. Uh, it's amazing work, but it will always be an uphill battle. And we just need to acknowledge that and continue to support efforts like this, not only for the American beetle, but for every species that's endangered. In 2019, this is also what I learned, the petroleum industry tried to get the endangered species status removed for the American bearing beetle because they wanted to do some gas and oil. Well, they wanted, yeah, some natural gas and some natural or in some oil mining or oil drilling in Oklahoma. So they, lo they lobbied hard to remove the status just so they could drill some oil. Of course. Of course. How predatory is that? Like, sorry, profits over intrinsically cool species. Thank you, capitalism. Thank you, capitalism. Love it. But I drive a car, right? Like, <laughs> here i yeah. am driving a gas car run <laughs> even if i didn't drive a gas car run i live in a place that is powered by gas yes. and oil and i like we're not innocent on, no, in all no, this no. but it is just crazy to think that they were like you know what let's remove the status just so we can drill for some oil <laughs> Let's move forward, not backward. Thank you to the Center for American Beetle Conservation for everything that you do. Keep up the hard work. I really want to go down and see if I can get like a tour of their like their breeding facility or something like that. I don't know. Maybe someday. That's the American Bearing Beetle. Some good news with the little caveat that we got to stay on our toes here a little bit. So mm -hmm. More work it yeah. will be done or needs done. Yeah. Very cool. I love them. Oh, my God, Sean. I love them so much. <laughs> oh, my God. People are like, what's your favorite insect? I'm like, oh, the American bear. Well, so have you? <laughs> I've never even seen one. No, oh, okay. I've never That's seen one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've never seen one in real life. I've seen the like the regular bearing beetle uh -huh. a lot of times. I have some in my personal like teaching collection. Nice. But I've never seen the American bearing beetle. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking at pictures on this impact report, and I'm like, ugh. Can I like volunteer that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the commute. It's four hours. <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Be a long day. That's that's yes, cool. I I mean, so to think like someone's job is like breeding beetles is. Oh, the dream, <laughs> Sean. The dream. I, I, yeah. I I saw a dung beetle while I was in the boundary waters, but I didn't see bearing beetle. Yeah. So are they up there, the the Americans? The American bearing beetle is not in North Woods of Minnesota. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a different species. Gotcha. They're a little bit smaller than the American bearing beetle. The American bearing beetle is a pretty hefty looking beetle. Mm. But yeah, I mean, they're they're just so cute and cool. Do you think something else has filled that food source for it that the passenger pigeon left behind or are they just finding anything that I they think can? there's enough you know I think there's enough mouth like mice species and mm. other bird species like I mean we have invasive birds right yeah. that are just everywhere um it just could be starlings and yeah it's there's food out there for them. okay okay but it's not it's not their food right it's not the food that they evolved alongside with yeah yeah 
whether they can adapt or not is, well, one has shown that yeah, they almost didn't, but with a little extra help, they we'll see if they can. Yeah. Obviously, the, I'm hopeful and people are hopeful. So Nice. Um, well. Very cool. If, if uh, li- Dear listeners, if you're curious where Zach's voice has been, Zach's busy. Yes. Uh, he's got some stuff going on. He's taken some classes. He is taking kind of a break ish from the podcast. Um, we're going to try to obviously involve him as much as he wants to and can be involved. Um, mm-hmm. So he's, he's not out, but there might be a few episodes here and there that Zach is missing from show him some love. <laughs> if you want to send us anything. <laughs> <Yes. so. laughs> um, cool. Also we have stickers. So uh, if you know Sean or Zach or I yep. uh, personally, or if you don't know us and you want a sticker, please reach out. We'll send you one. Sean, did you get a chance to look at them? Oh, they're fantastic. I already started yeah, passing them out. People are loving it. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I should have sent them a long time ago, but I didn't <laughs> because uh, I'm a trash person. <laughs> no. so. <laughs> please, yeah, reach out if you want anything. If you have episode ideas, whatever, we'd love to hear from you. So, and uh, I think we'll wrap it up there, Sean. Yes. Unless you've got anything else to add. No, you, you said it. Okay. Well, as always, we'll sign off with how, 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 how.